I'd like to welcome all of you to the first convening of the Voices of Hunger on campus um, for institutions in Massachusetts and, the, and in the region. Um, all of you have heard over the news or have experienced on your own campuses or your own institutions that hunger on campus um, is a problem. And never in my wildest dreams, having spent 25 years as an educator in higher education, would I think that I would be convening on a Friday morning before graduation a conversation on hunger. Um, it is sobering. And I said to someone the other day when they said, well, Pam, what the heck? You're a college. You're not a social service institution. What the heck are you doing working on hunger? And I said to her, I'm not feeding folks because it's part of my mission. I'm feeding folks because part of my mission is access, retention, and completion, and a lifelong fight to overcome the effects of poverty on our next generations. So today, we will have a, a, a pretty busy working session. And I promise you the outcomes for today are threefold. One, we must begin looking at data, not just anecdotal evidence of hunger, but to quantify this problem so that we can move not only our students along their road, of, road to success, but also to figure out how to have policy work done on our campuses and across the region so that we can take care of this problem for good, not just today, but forever. The only way that we can do that is to be able to, as all of you know, identify the problem and then find solutions to the problem. So when you leave today, I'm hoping that you will have in your hand three things that you can do immediately on your campuses and in your institutions to help the students in front of you right now. And that you will also have three things that you will take with you that are the first policy steps that you will take on your campus or wherever you are working that will move the policy conversation locally, regionally, and nationwide. Um, we, we will talk more about what that looks like as the day go on, but remember, that's the promise, right? That you will understand how, how, how data will help you make your case, to take three things back with you that you can do immediately, and to know where your place is in the policy conversation. Um, we have a number of, um, a number of really terrific friends with us today who has moved this problem um, onto the surface and to the notice of, of the nation. Um, and they will, they will tell us what they're doing and what their hopes and dreams are. But first I want to acknowledge folks that has made today possible and who has fed our students over the years. Um, I'd like to thank our, our College Foundation for sponsoring this event today. Um, they have been doing the work on hunger for a long time. And I want to call attention to two folks in the audience. One is Mr. Bob Strassler. Bob, wave your arm. And Mr. Alan Morse. Wave your arm, Alan. So, so Bob has been, so Bob has been um, gathering a group of friends for us called the Oasians. And they have been um, donating to our One Solid Meal program. But Bob has also been doing work way before that. There are always $25 gift cards to Stop and Shop at our single stop office. And Bob has been the um, sponsor for that for a number of years. And he's, he's my Jiminy Cricket number one. Um, he is my conscience. Um, this is the work we do. I'd like to also um, thank the Greater Boston Food Bank, who has been supplying us um, f um, with materials for our uh, mobile food pantry, food for free. Um, they've been feeding our students. The Food Link has been feeding our students with us. Um, and, and, and also our, our hunger team on campus. We have a core number of folks who are working on this initiative. And they're from all over the college, not just where you think folks might be concerned about this particular issue. So stand up and wave your arms, please. These are your facilities, facilitators for today. So if you need to know, they're the people to ask. Um, I'd like to first bring on, bring on to the podium um, 
a beloved commissioner. And I don't use the word beloved too often. Um, to be beloved, you have to be a scholar and a gentleman or a lady. You have to really care about community colleges and understand how community colleges work. And when you bring issues to him, like hunger and homelessness, he doesn't run the other direction, and he helps you work on it. And to me, he is beloved for all the things that he does for our students. And I'm, I'm very, very, very proud to call him not only boss, but my inspiration. So Commissioner Carlos Santiago, please. Thank you so much and good morning. Generally, I'd give Pam a hug, uh, which, well, no, you know, I have a cold. Oh. Uh, so I've, I've, warned, I've warned her, her off. Um, uh, I am a bit under the weather. Um, and uh, when Katie Abel looked at my calendar and she said, are you going to the uh, Voices of Hunger Summit? Um, I said, I think I have some conflicts. Uh, but I think we can, we can work it out. So I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, this is uh, very important to me. And I do need to acknowledge that my uh, knowledge about this subject really arose at a meeting I had on this campus uh, almost two years ago. Uh, as part, when I became commissioner, I did this kind of listening tour, went to the campuses. This is among the first ones I visited. And I met with um, really, uh, the, the, the campuses, I said, I want to meet with students, have an opportunity to meet with students. And President Edgar said, we've got a great group of students. Uh, and they were really, you know, successful students, high achieving students. And I sat around the table with them. And we talked about higher education. And I asked them what were the obstacles to their success. And I started to hear things that as an academic, I never expected to hear. And we're talking about, I probably met with 10 or 12 of those students. Uh, again, these were successful students, high achieving students, and one of the, the, the ten, uh, three said that uh, they were homeless or had been homeless. And the others talked about hunger. It was uh, a wake-up call, something that I did not expect. I expected them to talk about tuition and fees and other issues, but there are four, uh, four areas that in, as part of the learning, uh, listening tour, learning and listening tour, um, there are four areas that I found that our students need support in. One was hunger, uh, homelessness, transportation, and daycare. These are not the typical expenses that we often talk about in terms of higher education, but they are the ones that students need to, uh, uh, to, uh, to overcome if they're going to be retained and they will be successful. Um, so we began to work with the, the, the institutions to learn how pervasive this issue was. Um, and we sent out questionnaires. We started by gathering some data. Um, we now know that uh, 13 community colleges, state universities, and all of the UMass undergraduate campuses have permanent or mobile food pantries, uh, or they've been directing students to pantries near campus. When I visit a campus now, one of the things I do is I say, show me your food pantry. Show me what, you're, what, what you've been doing. Um, a third of our public campuses saw an increase in students being served by these food pantries between 2015 and uh, 2016. So part of our uh, role is to provide data and provide evidence and information to understand this issue uh, as well. We are now, under the leadership of Katie Abel, uh, we are now uh, addressing the issue of homelessness. And again, we are studying the extent of the problem, uh, the extent of the issue. Uh, we have, um, and two of our campuses, anybody here from Bridgewater State? Here you go. Um, how about from Framingham State? There you go, in the back. Both of those institutions have volunteered to uh, participate in pilots to provide um, uh, beds uh, and living quarters uh, for students. Uh, and we're, we're working with the Department of Health and Human Services, and we want to see how this works. Uh, we think we can get some state resources to support these institutions. The pilots will be relatively small. In, in Bridgewater, we're talking about five or six students. But we know during the summertime is a particularly difficult time for, for students. Uh, students will couch surf. 
They will live in their cars uh, and they will do um, uh, uh, other things that they should not need to do to uh, maintain their, their student status and, and, and work as well. So I want to thank all of you for your efforts uh, in, in this initiative. I think it's very important. Um, you've got a great lineup of speakers. I had the opportunity to talk to Sarah earlier and realize that uh, she mentioned to me, she said, you know, um, she talks a lot about Milwaukee, uh, which has uh, significant issues of inequality. Uh, and I was um, chancellor at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee for six years. And she told me that her project started when I was at, uh, during my tenure there. Um, and uh, she worked a lot with our, our faculty and, and students as well. When I got to that institution, the retention rate for Africa, for first semester retention rate for African American males was under 20%. And I said, are you telling me that we are losing 80% uh, of our students in their first semester? And the answer was yes. And I said, well, that's something we, we have to address. So I appreciate the work that you've done on that, uh, uh, in that area. Thank you so much. I, uh, I've got a couple other speeches to make today. So I'm trying to keep my voice uh, uh, going. But uh, uh, it's, this is important work. President Endinger mentioned this notion of uh, this, uh, and I've had the similar uh, critics who will say, that's not our core mission. Why are we doing this? And what I tell them is, look, today our student population has changed. The old model, the gatekeeper model, is no longer the model we need to follow. We need to follow a student success model, and we need to, to really address the changing needs of our students if we are to be successful. You're doing it at this campus. You're doing it at your campus. Thank you so much. Thank you. He's my commissioner. You can't have him. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Santiago. Um, I want to bring up to the stage next Barbara, um, Barbara Keynes. Where's Barbara? Oh, there she is. So Barbara is the, is the president of uh, Mass Campus Compact. And all of you probably already work with Campus Compact on your, um, on, on, um, at your institutions. But I want to bring a particular, um, a particular perspective to this. If you're going to work on hunger and homelessness and these issues, you're going to need partners. Your best partners are your students. Because they are your force, your workforce, your volunteer force. And Barbara is just the expert and uh, trying to how to get that to come together. So uh, the, the, the expert and the queen of civic engagement, come on up. <laughs> okay, I want everyone in my office now to start calling me queen. Um, but thank you, PM. And I want to uh, thank uh, Bunker Hill and the team that we've worked with for the last few months for inviting us into this partnership of focusing on uh, food insecurity on college campuses. You're probably all wondering, well, what do we have to do with it, similar to what uh, the commissioner just talked about. And I'm gonna just briefly tell you who we are. There, we do have some old friends in the audience, and I know you know who Campus Compact and Massachusetts Campus Compact is, but I think it's important for the others, for us to get acquainted, to become partners, to become friends, and if you're kind of keeping track of what tools I'm taking away with me today, please think of us, Massachusetts Campus Compact, as a new partner, as a tool with resources about colleges and food insecurity. Who are we? Briefly, we've been around for 30 years. Campus Compact, there are 35 state offices across the country. Massachusetts Campus Compact has been here over 25 years. We're an organization, a college organization of college presidents of four-year public, private, the community colleges across the state, all the college presidents that believe strongly that civic learning is an important part of an undergraduate education. And we do this through various mechanisms. How do we do that? How do we teach students about civic learning and civic engagement? We've been doing that for 25 years, and we've partnered with all our members to help them build civic engagement centers, to learn how to 
work with uh, partners out in the community, to work on social justice issues that are confronting the community and our students, and to really raise the awareness of social injustice. So that's why we're at the table, because we want to continue that work. And we also know that our members have been focusing on this issue for quite a while, as the President said. And I see some of my colleagues here from some of our member institutions that I know have been working on this issue for quite a while. I want to take a few minutes to also thank our AmeriCorps VISTA, Marie Dillivan, if she could stand. Where are you, Marie? The reason I point Marie out is for the last good, I think it's at least six months, she's been doing research on this issue and scanning the landscape of what is going on in food insecurity on all our member campuses. And what we've done with that information, thank you Marie, is we've built a whole toolkit and resource section on our website. So that's something else that you can take with you today. You will see our website address in one of the flyers in the pockets. Um, pre please refer to that. Um, you'll also notice on the flyer, and I've mentioned Marie, that many, much of our work is done through our MAC AmeriCorps VISTA uh, membership group. And we are still recruiting, meaning if member institutions are interested in an AmeriCorps VISTA to work on this issue on their campus, please talk to us or talk to our program manager, Sharon is here today, and we also have literature. So I want you to remember that we are here as a partner, as a resource. We're going to continue to work on the issue of food scarcity and hunger over the next year. We will have a few more convenings, which we haven't planned out yet, but we would like to have another large statewide convening about what are our member institutions doing about this issue and how can we help resolve it. I also want to point out that Again, there are institutions in this audience that have been working on this issue and you'll get to share at the table. And one comes to mind, we have a community college in addition to Bunker Hill out in the middle of the state that has a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship program where students work with students that are homelessness, that are homeless, that also are um, looking for food, looking for ways to stay in school. So, and they're now opening and hoping to open up a food pantry in the fall. So you'll hear about all of these things over the next few minutes. I want to thank you again for inviting us to be part of it. And please come up to me and say, how can we work together? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Marilyn Kuhar, and I'm the executive director of the Bunker Hill Community College Foundation. The foundation is proud to be the presenting sponsor of this Voices of Hunger convening, as its goals align with the mission of the foundation, which is to support programs and services that help students at Bunker Hill stay in school and complete their program of studies. Last year, the foundation dispersed more than $407,000 in emergency assistance, textbook assistance, direct food assistance, and scholarships. Thank you. Now we get on with the program, and I'm honored to introduce our keynote, Sarah Goldwick Rabb, whom the Chronicle of Higher Education calls a defender of impoverished students and a scholar of their struggles. She is Professor of Higher Education Policy and Sociology at Temple University and founder of the Wisconsin Hope Lab, the nation's only translational research laboratory seeking ways to make college more affordable. Sarah confronts the problems, the real problems, preventing low and moderate income students from being successful with striking statistics honed by her team by sound research and also with her fervent passion, and as a result, it's moving these issues towards national policy solutions. Her latest book, Paying the Price, College Costs, Financial Aid, and the Betrayal of the American Dream is an Amazon bestseller, and by the way, the book will be available for sale 
here and signing. Um, and proceeds from it go back to funding the research. Um, and um, proceeds from her publicity actually funds a, um, um, what's called the FAST Fund, uh, another way of, um, of, of supporting um, these programs at different college campuses. At any rate, her book has been featured in the New York Times Review of Books, C-SPAN's Book TV, and other venues, including on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. And I think a link to that is on our website. I saw that interview and was amazed that anyone, but particularly an academic, could render Trevor Noah speechless. Just last year, Politico magazine named Sarah one of the top 50 people shaping American politics. She is an inspiration, a guide, and all of our Jiminy Crickets on our shoulder, Sarah. All right, well, thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, this is really a privilege. I have been hearing about Bunker Hill Community College for a long time, and I've been working with many members of Pam's team uh, Wick and Kathleen and David and others for a while, but I've never actually gotten to be here. So it's really wonderful. And it's also great to be in Massachusetts because we need hope these days. And you all are one of our hopes. Okay, so I'm looking to you uh, for support for Ford Movement. The nation needs leadership. It's not coming from Washington. It's going to come from here. Please. Please. <laughs> all right, well, um, you know, a couple of the prior speakers uh, said some things about the moments in which they came to realize that hunger was a problem. And I want to share with you a moment at which I was taken aback as an educator. But it wasn't at a place like this. I've never taught at a community college, although I aspire to someday. I've never been an educator in an environment where two-thirds of the students were receiving the federal Pell Grant. I spent 12 years at one of those state flagships, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a place that's better known for its football than for enrolling large numbers of low-income students. Okay, it's about 10 to 12 percent in a given year that are receiving that support. A far cry from where I am now at Temple, an urban serving institution where we have 30%. But it was there that I began as an assistant professor with very little teaching experience, getting up there in front of a class, teaching sociology of education in the most interesting way I could manage. And it was there that I first watched a younger person, this was an 18 year old, fall asleep in front of me. I'm sure those of us who teach in the room, I'm not the only one who's seen the head bob, the drool down on the table. And let's be honest, I'm not the only one who's been kind of put off, insulted, right? I, I had a lot of things going through my head. I thought, do you not want to be here? Do you not understand how much you're paying for this? Am I really boring? Okay. What was interesting about my response was how divorced it was from my research. This happens sometimes. I study undergraduates, and especially the ones who don't finish college. But I wasn't thinking about data. I was just feeling my own personal emotions. And so I was judging this young woman. And the second time it happened, I thought, all right, that's enough. And I walked up to her at the end of class, and I said, come see me in my office hours to which she looked at me with absolutely terrified eyes because she was a first generation college student. As it turned out, she had no idea what happened in office hours. She didn't know what to expect. She actually thought I was gonna yell at her. I was thinking about yelling at her. But. Uh, so she came into my office a couple days later and she sat down and I looked at her and I said, what's going on? You know, it, it costs all this money to be here and you come in and you go to sleep. And she started to cry. And I pulled out the obligatory box of tissues, passed them to her. And she proceeded to tell me that the paying for college thing that one does was not going as planned for her. She thought with her family that they had figured out what things cost, and they were wrong. It just cost a lot more. 
And so she was having trouble buying the basic necessities, and as a result, she had taken a second job working the graveyard shift at the local grocery store stocking shelves because they pay more at night when she worked at night. And she would get off that job right before my class started in the morning and come into class and sit down and do what she had missed doing the night before, which was sleep. Okay, so I didn't know what to do about that. Uh, UW-Madison hadn't provided us with any sense of what to do with students facing economic insecurity. I did the only thing that I knew how to do, which was to give her a work-study job, hire her as a research assistant. The thing that appalls me when I look back was, again, how divorced I was from the research, from the data. And I kept her in my mind over the next several years as I began this study on financial aid recipients and started meeting not just one or two in my own classes, but hundreds and even thousands across the whole state. When I started that work and we set out to go meet individual people, I was preparing my graduate students for that work and again, thought I was preparing them for the challenges. I said, some of these students are gonna be very upset they can't buy their books. Some of these students are gonna be very upset they can't buy their laptops. Some of them can't pay tuition. And once again, I had overlooked. A graduate student came back after an interview and she said, nothing is okay. What do you mean nothing's okay? She said, you didn't prepare me. I said, what did I, what did I miss? She said, you never told me that an 18 year old would sit across from me and when I asked her how college was going, would tell me it wasn't okay because she hadn't eaten in two days. Okay? These are actually not new problems. That's what we're coming to realize. These are not new problems. Students know. As I've been conducting this work over the last several years, an incredible number of people who are themselves college graduates, including people in some very powerful positions, have opened up to share their stories that this has happened to them. That when they were in college, they were food insecure. It just wasn't something that we talked about. So I think we have to admit that. We're not talking about something that is brand new. It's just that we're starting to say it out loud perhaps for one of the first times. It is so important to remember that I saw this at a state flagship, that my students saw this at an urban serving university, that we see this at community colleges, that let's be honest, my colleagues across town at Harvard are seeing this. I'm now grateful that thanks to these prods, these nudges, I've turned into the data, that we've collected information from all over the country, and I no longer need to rely on anecdote to assert that food insecurity is a challenge on college campuses everywhere. What we don't know or what we think we don't know, we only don't know because we don't ask. So think about how many surveys we field of our students all the time. We ask them all kinds of questions about whether they're prepared for college, what their academics were before. We test the heck out of them, right? We ask them about their activities and clubs and we focus a lot on social cohesion. We don't focus that much on their basic needs. We never ask them about when they're talking about their adjustment to college, if they were surprised that the program that served them a free breakfast or a free lunch in high school disappeared the day they enrolled in 13th grade. Because that's really what it is. I'm not putting anybody down to say that what we're doing is grade 13 and 14 and 15 and 16. We can call it higher ed. It's education. And it takes the same basic things to learn material in those grades as it does in grades six, seven, eight, or nine. And yet in those grades, we have a federal policy that most of us cannot imagine removing. Despite what some say, there is free lunch in this country. And it matters. It matters on so many levels. As educators, teachers have revealed that they are very aware that if they want to get better test scores from their students in their classrooms, they feed them. 
right? Under the NCLB accountability pressures, there is good evidence now that is in fact what a lot of teachers did. But in college, we, th we some of us, still feel like that's not our job. Well, it, it isn't, except that it is if we want good outcomes. These are just the basic tools. One thing I want to make sure that you all know is something that I assumed but didn't have data to back me up on this until very recently. And that is something about the students themselves. So in the most recent survey that my team did, which involved 33,000 students at 70 community colleges in 24 states, including this college, we, as a set of questions, asked them about how they spent their time. Okay, so we didn't just ask them about their economic constraints and about whether they'd eaten that day and whether they'd ever been homeless. But we asked them about how they spent their time. And we did this because there are so many folks out there who basically say the reason students don't finish college these days is they're just not that interested in school. That once upon a time we were much more academically committed, today we are academically adrift. So we measured how much time they commit to their schooling and their homework. And then we cut that data by whether or not they were homeless. Lo and behold, homeless college students spend as much time on their academic pursuits as any other student. What it takes to achieve that, I think, has got to be very substantial. They spend time working, they do access financial aid, and they are in class. In other words, they have grit coming out of their ears. What they need from us is recognition that their resilience is not the problem. They need somebody somewhere to fill in those gaps to ensure that they have their, what, what they need. And what the data also tell us is that these are not just hardworking individual people with personal problems. We have a problem that is a public problem, deserving of a public policy response. We cannot allow this to be framed as that one student who you met who has that situation, or that other student who you met who's going through a hard time. When we see numbers like we have obtained from our research, which now, in two different studies, using somewhat different methods, have both arrived at the same statistic, which is that 13 to 14 percent of the nation's community college students are homeless, that is nobody's personal trouble. In fact, I'd argue it's probably the case that food insecurity affects as many college students as remediation does. If you think about how much money and time, especially from philanthropies around the country and states, they've been spending on the remediation crisis, when hardly any have spent time or attention or money addressing food, it makes you pause, especially when I think we're going to know very soon that we could actually change those remediation rates, change those placement test scores, simply by feeding people. So these numbers tell us that we must act. They tell us it's non-optional. They don't necessarily tell us exactly what to do yet, and that's something that we need more data on. Now, many of you, I know, are working on food pantries. And there is a national organization called the College and University Food Bank Alliance that represents the nation's food pantries and tries to help serve as support to them. If you access them, you probably have no idea that they're a volunteer organization with literally no budget. And that their executive director, until now, had no full-time job doing them. But you may not know, as well, that this month they're hitting their 500th member. I think it's pretty incredible, I think it's pretty stark. 500 colleges that just over the last few years have opened food pantries. And at the same time, we know that food pantries are Band-Aids, and they're not even great ones at that. I'm not saying don't do it, but I am saying be very careful at assuming that the food pantry is gonna get the job done because people go to food pantries in emergencies, right? It's supposed to be the last resort. 
And student-run food pantries in particular, while they're fabulous because the students are running them, are also at great risk because they are students' projects. And as we all know, there's a lot of churn with students. The best food pantries are institutional priorities funded by the institution's budget, central to the institution's mission, and they are part of a network of additional efforts. So there are additional efforts happening. I want to name just a few. You're going to be hearing a lot more about these in the coming year because a lot of us are working to move beyond food pantries. For example, there are now meal voucher programs, right? Programs like we mentioned before where students are being given access to the cafeterias to get a hot meal. This is important not only because a student is fed, but because they are allowed to do what you all are doing at your tables, which is to sit around with other people and connect over coffee or lunch. That social connection is something that is lost when you're sitting at home eating what you took home from the food pantry. Swipes have started to be part of this discussion. We need to talk to our nation's major food service providers about the incredible amount of profit that they're deriving from missed meals, meals missed by first generation and other working college students who buy meal plans and don't use every meal that then generate a profit. Those extra swipes should be returned to the students who need them. Food scholarships, an innovation that is being pioneered in Houston. We're taking a good look at a partnership between the Houston Food Bank and the Houston Community College, where the food bank is proactively offering food scholarships. It's exactly what it sounds like. Instead of cash, it is a card for ready access to food provided by a food bank, which has a much greater diversity of food often than a campus food pantry. It is a promise and it is a proactive one that says you can take the food costs out of your budget now, spend it on your housing, for example, because we've got your back when it comes to food. Community gardens, something that has been talked about for a long time, now being married with these ideas of addressing food insecurity. We have to admit that for a long time these community gardens have basically been a way to help all students, regardless of need, to have more fruit and vegetables. That's great, but who's the student that's there when the garden delivery is available? It's often not the students with the most need. And of course, we're also seeing efforts to address housing as well as food because we know these things co-vary. We need more data. And I do not say that as a researcher. I hope you can tell I would never collect data for research's sake. We collect data to create change. We collect data because we need to know how to create the most effective change. There are limited resources on our campuses. I do sympathize with those who say, really, <laughs> another thing, another program, another initiative, another job, another task on my shoulders? Okay, public higher education in particular is deeply underfunded right now. So we need to make sure that the efforts that we do take and the money that we do spend is achieving the outcomes that we need. And ensuring students' wellness and well-being during college is one of those outcomes. But another really important one is keeping them in school. So when you have a new initiative, it's important to collect information about the outcomes of those that you serve and the outcomes of those you wish you could serve but you can't. I am confident you have waiting lists all over the place for your most generous programs. Use those waiting lists. Maybe you can't serve those students right now, but you can use the number of students on that waiting list, the stories of students on that waiting list, and the outcomes of students on that waiting list to build the case that you need a shorter waiting list because you need more resources. We need to know more about how campus collaborations across institutions can work. I'm so glad to hear about partnerships here in Massachusetts. Please model this for the rest of the country, okay? We need to stop acting like, it, like our students will stay in one place. My career actually began studying students who transfer, and we are now in an age where 50% of all college students will attend more than one institution. So let's work together on their behalf so that we get out of their way. Partnering to address issues like this might actually help to create the transfer pathways for those students. What we need now are people who are committed to serving the students that we have with all your heart, with all your effort, with all your resources, rather than wishing that we had different students. Okay, we have what we have. 
These realities may only be getting worse in the coming years, if we're honest with ourselves, which is why it is time to act, and it is time to document what you do when you take action so that others can learn from you. I've begun over the last couple years to host national conversations on these issues, and I want to mention to you all that you are invited to be part of that. It's great to work across your state. It's also wonderful to teach other people what Massachusetts is doing. So a couple years ago, several members of this institution traveled to Milwaukee and met with about 150 other people around the country working on food and housing insecurity. This fall, we'll make that opportunity available to anybody in the country who wants to come and hear and talk about these issues in Philadelphia on October 23rd and 24th. I'm hoping that if you come, or if you're in touch in the meantime, you'll be telling us about what you're doing, what you're working on, what your challenges are, but most importantly, how you're taking steps forward. So I look forward, I'm gonna be around for the rest of today for this wonderful event. I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, happy to, to share whatever information I have and uh, to be contacted at any time. And I believe I'm gonna take a few questions. If we have, yes, absolutely. Thank you.